In this episode, I'm going to show you why Mary was not sinless and why the Immaculate Conception is a false doctrine. We're going to look at the actual meaning of Luke 1.28 and the Greek word kikaratomene, which is translated as highly favored. And we're going to consider whether or not Mary was actually full of grace. And I'm going to show you why it's both possible and true that Jesus was born of a sinner. Hi, my name is David Cipriano. I'm a youth pastor and my goal is to teach the Bible and to help you follow Jesus. Now this episode is part two of two of my teaching about Mary and the Immaculate Conception. Last week I made a video showing you four reasons why Mary was a sinner. And if you haven't seen that video, then you might wanna watch that one before this one. So in this episode, I'm going to show you why Catholics say that she was sinless and I'm going to show you Catholic arguments for the Immaculate Conception along with my rebuttals to those arguments. So I'm going to be addressing both sides of the issue and showing you why Catholics are wrong about Mary. So if you're not familiar with the Immaculate Conception, this is a Catholic dogma that states that Mary, whose conception was brought about the normal way, was conceived without original sin or its stain. That's according to Catholic answers. And so I want to make it clear that the Immaculate Conception does not refer to the conception of Jesus, but rather to the conception of Mary. And this Catholic doctrine became a dogma in 1854 when Pope Pius IX declared this. We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. And so Catholics believe that Mary was protected from original sin and that she was conceived without it. And they believe that Mary was sinless throughout her entire life until her bodily assumption into heaven. And if you're not sure what original sin is, this is the moral corruption that we possess as a consequence of Adam's sin. So because we're descendants of Adam, we're all born with a sin nature, meaning that doing wrong comes comes naturally to us and that we can't completely stop sinning on our own. And so for those who believe in the Immaculate Conception and the sinlessness of Mary, they'll give many different arguments about why she never sinned. And to be honest, I didn't realize until recently just how big of a belief that this is among Catholics. My understanding before I became educated about it was that some Catholics believed it, but not all. But no, the sinlessness of Mary is actually a Catholic dogma that you have to believe to be a good Catholic. If you don't believe that Mary was sinless or that she was immaculately conceived, then that makes you a heretic according to the Catholic Church. And so I'm going to cover in this video some different arguments that Catholics will give in defense of this belief. I'm going to cover their arguments and then I'm going to show my rebuttals to those arguments. So here's five reasons why Catholics say that Mary was sinless. And number one, it's because Jesus couldn't have been born from a sinner. So Catholics would say that not only is the Immaculate Conception true, but it's also necessary. In other words, it has to be true. And so Catholics believe that without the Immaculate Conception, then Jesus would have received Mary's sinful flesh. They'll argue that Mary, as the mother of Jesus, had to be sinless, and that God gave her that privilege of being sinless, and that from Mary's conception, she was sanctified and sinless because of her special role in bringing the Son of God incarnate into the world. And yet this argument just doesn't work logically, because really 
if Jesus' mother had to have been sinless in order for him to be sinless, then her mother must have also been sinless, and then her mother's mother would have had to have been sinless, and then her mother, and then so on. If Jesus had to have had a sinless mother in order for him to be sinless, then there would have had to have been a line of sinless women going all the way back to Eve. And so this argument for Mary's Immaculate Conception just doesn't work because you would have to keep working your way all the way to the beginning of creation and create this continuous line of sinless people along the way. And clearly the Bible shows us no evidence that that's true. And Mary, as a descendant of Adam, would have received and inherited this sin nature. The Bible shows us that by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so Mary would be included in having this sin nature. Now, sometimes people who believe in the Immaculate Conception will make the argument, why would God choose a sinner? If God wants to bring his son into the world, and if God is sending somebody to be the savior of mankind, then God would have had to have chosen a really special person to give birth to this one. So why would God choose a sinner? Well, the truth is that God picked a sinner to give birth to a Messiah because nobody else is available. God chose a sinner for this role because sinners are the only option. Because remember, the Bible teaches that all have sinned and that there is none who are perfectly righteous. You see, God has the right and the ability to do anything that he wants. And it's not up for us to say whether or not God could have picked a sinner to give birth to Jesus. That's God's choice, not ours. And that's what he did. You see, whenever people say that a perfect holy God couldn't have been born from a sinner, this is just merely human logic. And there's really a lot of things that God does that shouldn't be able to happen, but he can do them because he's God. And even just the virgin birth itself is not something that's supposed to happen according to our scientific laws, but God was able to do it because he's God. God created the world out of nothing. Jesus turned the water into wine. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that we can't explain just through simple human logic or through science. And God does a lot of things that shouldn't be able to happen according to our knowledge. But God has those miraculous abilities because he's God. And so whenever people say that God couldn't have been born from a sinner, that's not up for us to say. God has the ability to do these miraculous things. And so God was able to bring the Messiah into the world through a sinner, through an imperfect human. You see, often people believe in the Immaculate Conception because they have the idea that it has to be true, because how else could she give birth to the Savior? But really, the Immaculate Conception isn't necessary. God's able to perform miracles just as he did by the very fact that she conceived as a virgin. And remember that the conception of Jesus and the virgin birth was all a miracle. We cannot explain this just through science or through human logic. We can't scientifically explain how Jesus was born from a virgin, how he was born of a natural woman while also being God. We can't explain the supernatural with the natural. And so the Immaculate Conception of Mary isn't a necessary doctrine, and it's not a true doctrine, because Mary was a sinner. Now, argument number two that Catholics will give for the Immaculate Conception is that Mary was full of grace. And so while the Immaculate Conception and the sinlessness of Mary isn't a biblical teaching, there are some Bible verses that Catholics will use trying to defend this idea. While there's no Bible verses that actually say Mary was sinless, that doesn't keep Catholics from using Bible verses out of context and twisting the meaning of the verses in order to teach this idea. And the most used proof text for saying that Mary was sinless is Luke 1, 28. And so we're going to read that verse, but first we're going to back up and give it some context. So we're going to start reading in Luke 1, 26. 
It says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And so verse 28 here is the most used verse by Catholics to say that Mary was sinless. And if you're anything like me, you just don't see it here. Nothing in this verse implies that she's sinless. The Immaculate Conception is found nowhere in this verse. And so what Catholic apologists will do is that they have to do some deep digging in the Greek to try to prove that the Greek word meant something more or something different than the English translation does. And I want for you to realize that this is a very common tactic among false teachers. False teachers will often pretend like the original language means something else than what the English translation does. See, if you're a teacher or a pastor or a priest or maybe a professor, the audience assumes that you know more than they do. And as a result, it can be really easy to deceive people by lying to them. You see, whenever people say that the original language means something else or something totally different, they know that their audience doesn't know any better. And as a result, they can deceive people by telling them that the original language is different. Now I realize, and I want to point out, that language translation is sort of an imperfect science and it's a bit of an art. But false teachers will often use the trick of saying that the original language means something else so that they can sneak in false doctrines because the audience just doesn't know any better. And this is what the Catholic Church does with Luke 1.28. You see, they will argue the Immaculate Conception by focusing on the word that's translated as highly favored. And this word in the Greek is kakeratomene, coming from the root word keratao, meaning to grace, to favor, or to accept. And Catholics will argue that the Greek word that's translated as highly favored, kakeratomene, shows that Mary was sinless. And there's a few ways that they will try to do this. One is by pointing out the fact that kakeratomene is never used in any other Bible verse, and that's true. Kakeratomene is only found once in the Bible, but Catholics will argue that since it's only found once, then that means that it's a made-up word. And they'll argue that this is a special title that the angel creates specifically for Mary. According to Catholic Answers, they say, The angel doesn't call Mary by her given name, but instead gives her a new name or title, Full of Grace. And Catholics will argue that whenever Gabriel says this to Mary, they're changing her name, and that it's similar to how God changed Abram's name to Abraham, or how he changed Jacob's name to Israel. And this is just simply not true. Saying that somebody is highly favored, or as the Catholics would say, full of grace, does not mean that you're renaming them. If you were to tell somebody that they were beautiful, this does not mean that you're changing their name to beautiful, it's just simply describing them. Or if you were to say that somebody is honored or beloved, that's not renaming them, that's just describing them. And so when the angel Gabriel says that Mary is highly highly favored using the word kakeratomene, this is not a title or a name. This was not a word that was just created specifically for the Virgin Mary. That's just how kiratao is parsed out when it's in that form. And I'm just going to be blunt and say that anybody who tries to use this argument for the Immaculate Conception just does not understand Greek. They don't understand grammar or how languages work, or even worse, maybe they do understand, and they are just intentionally deceiving the audience. You see, the Bible shouldn't be expected to have every single word that's in the language. It shouldn't be expected to have every single parsing of every word. 
The Bible is not a dictionary, and the fact that a specific form of a word is only found in the Bible once doesn't mean that it's a made-up word or that it's not a real word. And while we're on that topic, I want to point out that Kakeratomene is often referred to as a hopox legomenon, and this is a term that's used only once. But actually, Kikaratomene is not a hopoxylgomenon, because while it's true that this specific form or this specific parsing of the word is only found once in the Bible, the same root word in the Greek is there in another verse. You see, Kikaratomene is a form of the word keratao, and another form of keratao is found one other time in the Bible. See, a form of this Greek word keratao is also used in Ephesians 1.6. Ephesians 1.6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So this phrase, made us accepted, shows up as a keratosin in the Greek, which is a form of keratao. And so if any of this sounds confusing, which it probably does, I'm going to show you an example in English. So talking and talked are both different words, but they're really different forms of the same word, which would be talk. And so just like how talking and talked are both different forms, but of the same word, kakeratomene and akeratosin are both different forms of keratao. So if a person tries to use the word kikaritomene to say that Mary was sinless and perfect, then you should be consistent with that meaning throughout the Bible. So if Luke 1.28 means that Mary was sinless, then Ephesians 1.6 should also mean that the believers in Ephesus were sinless too. But obviously they weren't, and so neither was Mary. Now, some will argue that since this word kikaritomene is a perfect passive participle, that it must have been done perfectly. But that's not what perfect passive participle means when it comes to grammar. And I would just say that if a person tries to use that logic, then they just don't understand grammar and they don't understand Greek. And this word also doesn't mean that Mary was graced perfectly in a way that she couldn't have ever sinned or that she couldn't ever sin again. Now, it is true that Mary had been highly favored, which was an action having taken place in the past before the announcement of the angel, but this doesn't mean that it happened at her conception where she was sinless and protected from original sin. Nowhere does the angel say that, and the Greek also doesn't necessitate that it happened. Now, I also want to focus on this phrase that Catholics will often use, full of grace, because Catholics will often claim that Luke 128 was mistranslated and that kikaritomene really means full of grace. And Catholics will really make a big deal out of this phrase. In their prayer, the Hail Mary, it starts out by saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. And Catholics will believe that Mary was sinless because she was full of grace. But really, it's very odd and weird that they'll make such a big deal out of the phrase, full of grace, when the Bible never even says this about her. You see, you can say that Mary was full of grace. I think that this would be an accurate statement, but it's odd to take that phrasing so far and to stretch that phrase out so much when the Bible and the angel don't even describe her that way. And the truth is that almost no English Bible version translates kikaritomene in that way. Not the NIV, not the NLT, not the ESV, not the KJV or the NKJV, not the CSB, not the NASB, not the RSV, and not even the infamous message version will translate this phrase as full of grace. You see, Catholics will make these huge leaps and bounds about a phrase that the Bible never even says about Mary. But let's say that for a moment that the Bible did say full of grace rather than highly favored. Let's grant that phrase for sake of the argument. And even if the Bible said that Mary was full of grace or that she had been filled with grace, that still wouldn't mean that she's sinless. 
You see, the Catholics will argue that being full of grace means that Mary was completely filled in a way where it was impossible for her to have ever sinned. But let's pay some attention to some other Bible verses where it describes somebody as being full of something. For example, Acts 6 8 says that Stephen was full of faith and power. Now, if Stephen is full of faith, does that mean that he was completely filled with faith for his whole life and that he never had one moment of doubt? Well, no, of course it didn't mean that. When it says that Stephen was full of power, does this make Stephen omnipotent? Does it say that Stephen had miraculous abilities and that he always possessed them? Well, no, being full of power doesn't mean that. It shouldn't be stretched that far. Or let's take another example in Acts 9.36, it's describing Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, and it says, this woman was full of good works. Now, if Tabitha was full of good works, was she perfect as well? Does it mean that she always did the right thing? Does it mean that Tabitha never sinned in her life? No, being full of good works doesn't mean that. So being full of something doesn't mean that you have to be perfectly full of it and never could have been or done anything else. That's just simply an expression. So even if Luke 128 was translated wrong and it should have been translated as full of grace, that still doesn't mean that she was sinless. And so whenever you tell a Catholic that Mary was actually a sinner, they may try to argue that no, she wasn't. Mary was highly favored. She was blessed among women. She was full of grace. And all of that is true because she was, but in no way does that equate to being sinless. And actually, the Bible makes similar statements about others having grace, and that doesn't mean that any of those people were sinless. In Acts 4.33, it says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In Romans 1.5, it says, By whom we have received grace. Ephesians 4.7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So the Bible makes some similar statements about other people having grace, and yet it doesn't mean that any of these people were sinless or that they were immaculately conceived. And so if Mary being full of grace or highly favored makes her sinless, then why doesn't that logic also apply to everybody else who received similar descriptions? You see, Mary being full of grace is a bad argument for the Immaculate Conception. Now, argument number three that Catholics will give for Mary's Immaculate Conception is done through typology. Now, in theology, this word type doesn't just mean a form. Like you might say that a Toyota is a type of car brand. That is not what type means in theology. See, type means something that foreshadows something else. So, for example, the Old Testament sacrifices were a type of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. They were foreshadowing something that later was to come. And Catholics will often abuse typology to teach the sinlessness of Mary. They will use pictures and parables and similarities to defend their beliefs. They will read into the Bible rather than reading out of it. They practice eisegesis, not exegesis. You see, they have their beliefs and they'll try to make the Bible fit their beliefs rather than just reading the Bible and then deriving their beliefs from there. And so since the Bible doesn't teach the Immaculate Conception, then Catholics will have to twist verses and add meaning to them to make the Bible fit their beliefs. And here's a few examples of how they do this. The most popular one and the most used one is to say that Mary was the Ark of the New Covenant. You see, Catholics will say that Mary was a fulfillment of a type and that Mary was a pure and holy Ark that was fit to carry the Son of God. And they'll say that as the Ark of the Lord in Moses' day carried the elements of the Old Covenant within it, so Mary carried the author of the New Covenant within her. 
And so Catholics will make these comparisons trying to prove that Mary was the Ark of the New Covenant. So for example, Elizabeth spoke with a loud voice whenever she saw Mary, just like how people in the Old Testament shouted for the excitement about their Ark. Or another is that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months, just like how the Ark was in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. Or another one is that John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb whenever he was near the Ark of the New Covenant, just like how David danced before the Ark when it was brought to Jerusalem. Now, I'm just going to be honest here. These arguments are really bad, and I didn't make these arguments up. These are actually the arguments that Catholics will use themselves. These analogies are so forced, and just because you find a similarity between two things, that just doesn't mean anything. It doesn't prove anything that Elizabeth shouted or that Mary stayed somewhere for three months. These are honestly just ridiculous comparisons trying to prove a point. And so you'll see that Catholics will abuse typology to teach unbiblical things about Mary. And even if the Bible declared somewhere that Mary was the Ark of the New Covenant, this type is like an analogy, and analogies are imperfect. You're not supposed to take every tiny little detail of an analogy and try to find something to fit it. And so the Catholic logic will say that since Mary was a fulfillment of this type, then she had to have been perfect and spotless and immaculately conceived. But even if Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, it still doesn't mean that she's sinless. So for example, Joseph from the Old Testament is often viewed as a type of Christ, meaning that his life in many ways foreshadowed the life of Jesus. But just because Joseph was a type of Christ, that doesn't mean that he was sinless. So even if Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant, that also wouldn't make her sinless. And the truth is that the Bible never refers to Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. And sure, you might find some similarities and you might make an interesting picture out of this idea, but you really have to force this typology. Even if the Bible showed this type, it still wouldn't prove the Immaculate Conception. You see, Catholics will believe that Mary was sinless because she was the Ark, and yet the Bible never even describes her that way. But even if it did, it still doesn't mean that she would have been perfect. Now, some other typologies that Catholics will use to prove the Immaculate Conception is to say that Mary was the new Eve, or that she was the queen mother, or that she was the mother of the king. But just like with the example of the Ark of the New Covenant, these types are forced and they are abused to teach Catholic doctrine. Here's a couple other examples of Catholic typologies or parables to teach the Immaculate Conception. And one is Jesus' parable of the wineskins. So in Mark 2, 22, he said, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. And so the Catholic argument will be that new wine can't be put into old bottles, and so similarly, Jesus couldn't have been born or carried by a sinner. And so this parable is used to teach the sinlessness of Mary. But keep in mind here that when reading this parable, it's just a parable. And be careful not to abuse them. Don't use a parable to teach something that wasn't taught in the parable. And this parable of the wineskins can't be used about Jesus' birth. Jesus isn't wine. Mary was not a bottle, and Jesus wasn't really even saying that you can't put new wine into old bottles, but rather that you shouldn't. Another verse that's used as a proof text for the Immaculate Conception is Job 14.4, where it says, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Now, on the surface level, this is true. 
I agree with this Bible verse because dirty things contaminate clean things. Something clean can't come out of something dirty. And this is why you shouldn't put food in a dirty container. And so on a surface level, this is true, but on a spiritual or a theological level, this is really stretching the verse because it might be true physically, but not spiritually, especially when it comes to Jesus. You see, an important principle to have in mind when studying and interpreting the Bible is that the Bible cannot mean what it never meant. And so when Job was using this poetical or figurative expression, he was not talking about the birth of Christ. He was rather just giving a principle. And if Job was talking about the birth of Christ, and if he was proving the Immaculate Conception, then this would actually present more theological problems than we already have. This would be a bigger issue than the issue of Mary being a sinner. You see, if this was what Job meant, then Mary's mom couldn't have been a sinner, and her mom's mom couldn't have been a sinner, and etc. The line keeps on going, and this would be a much bigger problem than just saying that Mary was a sinner. You see, while Catholics will argue that Jesus couldn't have been carried or born by a sinner, I actually see no problem with this reality. Remember that Jesus was born into a sinful world, and he lived in the world. Jesus spent time with sinners, and yet throughout all of this, he remained perfectly holy and sinless. And so it's not a problem at all that Jesus was born by a sinner. The biggest problem with the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is that it's just not taught in the Bible. This teaching is not biblical, and it's not even necessary. The Bible never teaches it, and it doesn't have to be true. You see, if you just read the Bible, you never would have come up with this idea. If you had never heard another person tell you this, if you had never heard these Catholic arguments in favor of it, if you had never went to a church that taught this thing, you never would have had the idea that Mary was sinless. And even though people are able to force some ideas onto the Bible and maybe explain it in a way that might make sense to some people, the idea that Mary is sinless just isn't biblical. It doesn't come from the Bible. Rather, it comes from the Catholic Church. Now, argument number four that people will use to say that Mary was sinless is the fact that the Bible never lists any of her sins. Catholics will often challenge Protestants by saying, name one sin that Mary committed. And this argument is sometimes used as a gotcha. And if we're being fair, the Bible never tells us a story where Mary sinned. We have no records of sins that she committed. And yet, this is just an invalid argument. Because you don't have to know which specific sins somebody committed in order to say that they were a sinner. So, for example, if I were to go out and meet a stranger, somebody that I had never met or seen before, I could say with confidence that at some point in their life, they had eaten food. Now, I might not know which specific foods, but I can confidently say that they've eaten something in their lives. Even if I don't have a list of the foods which they ate, I can still confidently say that they've eaten something. And the same principle is true about Mary. Because yes, it's true that we don't have a list of all of the sins that she committed. And yes, it's true that the Bible doesn't tell us specifically that she sinned. We can confidently believe that she did. Because none is righteous, all have sinned, and the Bible never gives us an exception about her. See, not much at all is said about Mary. We don't have a record of wrongs that she did. But if we're going to use that argument, then try to name one sin of Joseph, or Daniel, or Stephen, or Enoch. See, if we're going to use the logic that since the Bible never lists somebody's sins, then they must not be a sinner, then we should also use that argument whenever we're reading things like genealogies. And so if somebody says, tell me in the Bible where it says that Mary was a sinner, well, the Bible doesn't need to say that she's a sinner. Because the Bible says that all have sinned, the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. Jesus said that there is none good but one, that is God. 
You see, it doesn't have to say next to every person's name that they were a sinner because they are included in all. And the Bible doesn't need to specifically call out Mary as a sinner because it calls out everyone and makes no exception for her. And could you imagine if it was a rule that the Bible had to say that somebody was a sinner for them to be a sinner? Could you imagine trying to read through a genealogy and next to every single person's name, it has to say, and he was a sinner? You see, Catholics might believe that saying that the Bible never lists Mary's sins is a good argument to say that she was immaculately conceived or that she was sinless. But if we try to use this logic for just about anything else, it's a terrible argument. It doesn't prove anything. Now, what I'm about to cover, I covered more in part one of this series, but Mary actually evidences that she's a sinner after she received the message from Gabriel. In Luke 1, starting in verse 46, it says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest day of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And so we see here that Mary calls God her Savior. And the fact that Mary calls God her Savior is an evidence that she was a sinner because only a sinner needs a savior. You wouldn't need a savior if you hadn't sinned. You wouldn't need to be saved if you had never been lost. And so the fact that the Bible never tells us a specific sin that Mary committed does not prove that she was sinless. In the number five, the final argument that Catholics will use to try to prove the sinlessness of Mary is just by saying that we need to respect Mary. You see, often whenever I've stated that Mary was a sinner, people will accuse me of hating Mary or disrespecting Mary. People will say things like, it's so low and so sad to see somebody hating Jesus' mother. But if we're just being honest, it is not disrespectful to call somebody a sinner. I would say that the Apostle Paul was a sinner, Peter was a sinner, Moses was a sinner, King David was a sinner. I would say that my wife, my mom, my dad, they are all sinners. Calling somebody a sinner is not disrespectful at all. It's just true. The only way that you would be disrespectful in calling somebody a sinner is if you're saying it in an intentionally disrespectful way. Maybe if you are name calling, maybe if you are using derogatory terms, but really I've never done anything like that to Mary. Nothing that I've said about her is disrespectful. I've never said anything like Mary was the worst, or that I'm better than Mary, or that Mary wasn't blessed. No, I've never said those things, and I've never heard anybody else say those things. I've just simply stated that Mary was a sinner. And Mary even implies it herself whenever she calls God her Savior. And so whenever Catholics say that Protestants are being hateful and disrespectful by calling Mary a sinner, this just isn't true and it's a false accusation. They're trying to paint the other side as badly as possible in order to try to disprove those other beliefs. And Catholics are just lying about this. When a Catholic says that somebody is disrespectful by calling Mary a sinner, they're just making a false accusation. Now, another thing that Catholics will often say about Mary is that she is the mother of God and that she is the Theotokos. Theotokos means God-bearer or one who gives birth to God. Now, I'm going to say about these terms, mother of God and Theotokos, is that these are true. These are accurate descriptions of Mary. Mary was the mother of God because Jesus was God and Mary was his mother. And so, yes, Mary was the mother of God. And while this is true, sometimes people will use this phrase and this teaching falsely. They will use this title or description in order to teach something that's unbiblical. Sometimes people use this to say that Mary was sinless, or it's sometimes implied that Mary created God. And while I agree that Mary was the mother of God and she was a Theotokos, that still doesn't mean that she's sinless. 
Now before we end this episode, I just want to say something about the Sola Scriptura debate. Sola Scriptura is a belief that the Bible alone is our sole authority as Christians. And this is something that I believe, but it's not something that the Catholic Church teaches. Often Catholics will say that you shouldn't just use the Bible. They'll say that you need to submit to Rome. They'll say the Bible never says Bible alone. And I think that all of these statements and all of these arguments are really just a convenient way to justify saying unbiblical things. You see, instead of just having the Bible as your authority, the Catholic Church will claim authority over the truth. And since the Catholic Church has claimed authority, you can't really argue with them. To them, they're right because they said that they're right. And as a result, the Catholic Church has a lot of doctrines and dogmas that go against the Bible. And yet you're not able to tell a Catholic that they're wrong because they don't believe that it's possible for them to be wrong. And since the Bible isn't their only authority, it results in them not caring too much about what the Bible teaches. And this idea, this rejection of Sola Scriptura, is how the Catholic Church has slipped in so many false teachings, such as the Immaculate Conception, because Catholics aren't bound to the Bible. They've given themselves permission to go beyond and sometimes even contrary to what the Bible says. And so if you're interested in a video about Sola Scriptura or whether or not the Bible alone should be our authority as Christians, then leave a comment down below and then in the future I'll do an episode on that topic. And if you haven't already, make sure to check out the previous episode of the podcast where I gave four reasons why Mary was undeniably a sinner. So thanks for watching and subscribe for more biblical teaching like this.